Bible prophecy is a fascinating study. And whenever you are talking about prophecy, you come into an area that is called compound probabilities, which means that everything that you add to that particular prophecy, all of the details that you might add, multiply the chances that it won't happen. This compound probabilities could probably be explained like this. Theoretically, let's say that one man in 10 is blind in his right eye. So how many men would you have to have in order to find one who is blind in his right eye? Theoretically, 10. Let's say that one man in 10 is deaf in his left ear. Now how many men do you need to find one who is both deaf in his left ear and blind in his right eye? A hundred compound probabilities. Out of the hundred men, you should be able to find 10, a uh, hundred men who are deaf in their left ear, you should be able to find 10 who are blind in their right eye. Out of the 10, you could find one who is both deaf in his left ear and blind in his right eye. Let's say that one man in 10 has red hair. Now how many men do we have to have at random to find a red-headed man deaf in his left ear and blind in his right eye? You need a thousand. And you see, every time you add a stipulation, you multiply the numbers that you need in order to find one that would fit all. And that's what makes Bible prophecy such a fascinating subject because it deals with events, it deals with things years in advance, and when they begin to come to pass, suddenly you begin to realize, you know, there's only one chance in 280,000 that that could happen. Or it all, you know, it all goes on. For instance, born in Bethlehem, Jesus born in Bethlehem uh, of Judea, as the prophet uh, Micah said, uh, there's only one chance in 10 to the uh, 280,000 that that could happen, so 10 times 2.8 uh, to the sixth power. So uh, you, you start compounding the chances. So let's look at some fascinating Bible prophecies, and I want you to know that these were written over 2,500 years ago. And yet, they are as update as tomorrow. Because as we go through these prophecies, we'll realize some of them have already been fulfilled and we realize that there are some that are being fulfilled today and there are some that will be fulfilled in the very near future as we're marking uh, the process of the development of these prophecies. I'm talking about the prophet Ezekiel. And back in chapter 36 of Ezekiel, uh, in verse 6, the Lord told Ezekiel, now I want you to prophesy concerning the land of Israel. Notice this is the land. It isn't the people of Israel. It is the land of Israel. And the Lord said, Mountains of Israel, you will shoot forth your branches. You will yield your fruit to my people of Israel, for they are to, at hand to come. The development of the agricultural capacities of this little land of Israel. The Lord is talking to the land, and he said, my people are about to come. The Zionist movement began in 1897, and uh, it uh, was an endeavor by some of the Jews to come back and to really begin to develop the land agriculturally and make it a place where Jews could come and find jobs and uh, could uh, busy themselves there in the land. 
Uh, that was about the time that they began the Kibbutzim and uh, this uh, modern Zionist movement beginning in 1897. Uh, and uh, at this time, anti-Semitism was very strong in Russia and in Europe and many Jews were seeking to find a place that they could escape uh, the great uh, persecution and anti-Semitism. And uh, so they began to come back to Israel and they began to buy up what was considered worthless land. The rivers that used to flow through the Sharon Valley on out into the Mediterranean had all become more or less blocked with silt dams uh, as the sand uh, is, was building up and thus the whole Sharon Valley was just malaria-filled swampland. But the Jews began to purchase the Sharon Valley great parcels of land there. They opened up the river so that they would flow again into the Mediterranean. They drained the swamp land. They planted eucalyptus trees that drink up a lot of the water. And they began to plant orange orchards there in the Sharon Valley. The Valley of Megiddo, the same thing. The rivers were dammed up that went into with the silt dams uh, and they opened them up and uh, they began to plant uh, great crops of cotton and other things there in the uh, valley of Megiddo. Up in the north, the northern part of the Galilee, the, uh, the whole area, if you get old Bible maps, uh, you will see it says Hula Lake. Uh, what that was was just a great swampland uh, because again of the buildup of the silt in the Jordan River and uh, thus it was sort of worthless land and yet the Jews were coming in and buying it and the Arabs who were owning a lot of the land uh, they sort of laughed all of the way to the bank saying those stupid Jews uh, they don't know, you know that this is worthless land swamps you can't grow anything here but yet in opening up the Jordan River and draining out the Hula Lake and all it, it was tremendous agricultural land as is uh, the Sharon Valley and all and you go there today and this land that was sort of desolate and wasted it is now fabulous agricultural land. And so uh, the Lord said to them concerning the land, I am for you, I will turn unto you, and you shall be tilled and sown. A land that laid desolate, a land that was not cultivated for 2,000 years, suddenly becomes rich agricultural land. The Jews began to uh, develop uh, the, the agricultural capacities of the land and the prophecy of Isaiah was fulfilled, Isaiah 27, 6, where it said, they that come of Jacob will take root, Israel shall blossom and bud and fill the face of the earth with fruit. Israel is probably about the size of New Jersey not very large, but yet it is the third largest exporter of fruit of the nations of the world today. God's word literally has come to pass. You can go over to Israel and you can see the visible proof of God redeveloping the land of Israel. Verse 10, Ezekiel 36. I will multiply men upon you, all of the house of Israel, even all of it. The cities will be inhabited and the waste shall be built. And I will multiply upon you man and beast. They will increase and bring fruit and settle after your old estates. And I'll do better unto you than at your beginning. And you shall know that I am the Lord. Only the Lord could do this. And thus he said, when I do it, you'll know that I am the Lord. I will cause my people 
to walk upon the land and they will possess you and you will be their inheritance and you will never again deprive them of their children. God goes on to explain that the reason why they lost this land in the beginning is that they had turned their backs on God and thus they were dispersed throughout the world. And uh, the Lord said, wherever you went, and the, the heathen, you actually uh, profaned my holy name. And uh, when the people would say, these are the people of the Lord, but they are out of his land. And so it was so for 2,000 years, the land lay desolate and just barren. But God said, I have pity for my holy name which the house of Israel has profaned among the heathen where they went. Therefore say to the house of Israel, Thus saith the Lord, I don't do this for your sakes, O house of Israel, but for my holy name's sake, which you have profaned among the heathen where you have been dispersed. But I will sanctify, God said, my great name, which was profaned among the heathen. And you shall know that I am the Lord, saith the Lord God, when I shall be sanctified in you before their eyes. Now this is an important phrase. I want you to think about it because we're going to come back to it. When I am sanctified before the world and before your eyes. We'll come back to that. Just tuck it away in the back corner there for a moment. God said, it's not for your sakes that I do this. I, be it known unto you, be ashamed and confounded for your own ways, O house of Israel. But thus saith the Lord God, in the day that I shall have cleansed you from all your iniquities, I will also cause you to dwell in the cities and the waste shall be built. The desolate land shall be tilled, whereas it lay desolate in the sight of all that passed by. And they shall say, this land that was desolate is become like the Garden of Eden. And the waste and the desolate areas in the ruined cities have become fenced and inhabited. Then the heathen that are left round about you shall know that I am the Lord and I build the ruined places and I plant that which was desolate. I the Lord have said it and I will do it. I like that. I like it when God sort of brags about himself and said I said it and I'll do it. And what can you say? Go over to Israel and you'll find out he's done it. He has kept his word. And of course, we dealt with many factors there. And if you compound those factors, the chance of this happening are minimal. Chapter 37. Now he's talked to the land and you're going to be planted and so forth. But when this happens, in chapter 37, Ezekiel sees this valley of dry bones scattered, dried. And God said to Ezekiel, can these bones be made to live again? Ezekiel said, well, Lord, you know. And he heard this sound and he, he heard the noise and he saw these bones as they began to come together. They formed into a skeleton that stood upon its feet. And then he watched as there came muscles and there came a flesh and then there came skin over it. And then the Lord said to Ezekiel, prophesy uh, unto these bones, cause, I will cause breath to enter into you and you shall live. Then he said unto me, these bones, son of man, are the whole house of Israel. Behold, they say our bones are dried, our hope is lost, we are cut off. Therefore prophesy unto them and say, thus saith the Lord God. Behold, O my people, I will open your graves. I will cause you to come out of your graves. I will bring you into the land of Israel. Let me ask you this. How many nations do you know 
that have been dispersed out of the land where they were living, where they were a nation, and for 2,000 years were scattered all over the world, but then remained a ethnic group, as did the Jews. Wherever they were, they were still Jews. And after 2,000 years, come back and be established in the land again and have their own land once more. As you and I well know, it's unparalleled in history. And yet God said, I said it and I will do it. And he goes on to tell the Jews there in chapter 37, and you shall know that I am the Lord when I've opened your graves, O my people, and I've brought you out of your graves, and it, I'll put my spirit in you, and you shall live, and I will place you in your own land, and then you will know that I am the Lord, and I have performed it. I've done it. God, again, is just sort of bragging on himself. And saying to them, Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I will take the children of Israel from among the heathen, whither they have gone, and I will gather them on every side, and I will bring them into their own land. And I will make them one nation on the mountains of Israel, one king, king over them all, and they shall no longer be divided into two nations as they were before they were dispersed and neither shall they be divided into two kingdoms any more at all. And in May 14, 1948, God fulfilled this promise to the nation of Israel after they had been dispersed for 2,000 years. Unparalleled. It can't be. And so we see how accurate the word of God is and how exacting as God predicted these things. So the land's been developed. The land has now become a part of Israel. God has brought them into the land just as he promised 2,500 years ago that he would do. Here the prophet Zechariah chimes in. He said, I will make Jerusalem a cup of trembling unto all of the people round about when they shall be in siege both against Judah and Jerusalem. And in that day I will make Jerusalem a burdensome stone for all of the people. And they that burden themselves with it shall be cut in pieces, though all the people of the earth be gathered together against it. And no sooner was Ben-Gurion making the announcement in May 10, 1948, that Israel was now a nation again. Egypt, Syria, Lebanon, Jordan, all sent their troops to destroy this newly birthed nation. The Egyptians took the Sinai Peninsula. The Syrians took the Golan Heights. The Jordanians took the West Bank. And though Israel had just a ragtag kind of a group of men, uh, they began to mount guns on jeeps and uh, they made the corridor uh, from Tel Aviv on up to Jerusalem. And uh, they were able to hold on to a portion of the land but much of the land was grabbed by the Egyptians and Syrians and uh, Jordanians uh, in 1948. But then come along to 1967 and uh, Egypt had ordered the UN troops out of the Sinai Peninsula because they were planning with Syria and Jordan again to destroy Israel, going to take the little part of the land that they still have and we're going to annihilate the nation. Israel 
knowing that the attack was imminent, planned a pre-attack against these three nations. And you know the story of the Six-Day War, how that during this time Israel took the Sinai Peninsula from Egypt, they drove the Jordanians out of the West Bank, and they took the Golan Heights from Syria. Again, God, as he said, would make Jerusalem a cup of trembling unto those round about who would be in siege against Judah and Jerusalem, and he would make them a burdensome stone to all of the people, and those that would burden themselves with them would be cut in pieces, and God cut in pieces the enemies of Israel in 1967 in that Six-Day War. In 1973, again, these nations decided that they were going to take this land from Israel. And uh, the same three nations, Jordan and Syria and Egypt, uh, in Yom Kippur, 1973, uh, planned uh, this uh, attack against Israel, a surprise attack uh, against Israel, and it was called the War of Annihilation. That was the code name for the war by these uh, nations that were surrounding Israel. It just so happened that we were in Jerusalem uh, on that fateful day, Yom Kippur in 1973, uh, when uh, it was a Sabbath day, Yom Kippur, and, and I had taken a group of uh, children that were on our tour with us down to the old city uh, in order that they might do some shopping in the Arab quarter. And as we were going through the Arab quarter, suddenly we heard these sirens and uh, we, the Arabs were all shutting their uh, shops down. And I said, what are you doing? We come down here to, uh, you know, to shop and all. And uh, they just began to yell at us. And uh, then we heard that Egypt and uh, Syria and Jordan began this war against Israel, and in the beginning, it looked bad. Russia had supplied them with a lot of armament, a lot of tanks, and up on the Golan Heights, in a 20-mile perimeter, uh, uh, Syria launched an attack with 1,200 tanks. And it, to get that in perspective, when Hitler uh, began his invasion of Russia. He had that many tanks, but they were over a 200-mile uh, perimeter. Here you have a 20-mile perimeter and that many tanks. Israel was caught by surprise, uh, and uh, they, they called up the troops. The TVs were off, radios were off, people were all sitting with their family, enjoying the, the, the Sabbath uh, for the holiday, and uh, they began to mobilize to defend Israel. Egypt crossed the Barlev line down there on the uh, Suez Canal and began to move up in the Sinai. Uh, the uh, Syrians began to pour down the Golan Heights, uh, and coming up to within a couple of miles of the Golani headquarters of the IDF up in northern Israel. Uh, they came in view of the uh, Sea of Galilee, and at that particular time, there were only two Israeli tanks against this whole armored division of Syrians. There was a young fellow, his name is Wib uh, uh, Greenwald, and he came up to, he heard that the war had started, so he came up to the Golani headquarters and said, I'm a tank commander, you know, give me some tanks and men, and we'll go out to try to defend uh, the Golan. And uh, they said, we only have uh, one operational tank, there's two we're working on, wait a little bit and we'll get it fixed and, and you can go. <laughs> so they... Uh, took off with the three tanks and began to engage uh, the Syrians uh, with their 
hundreds of tanks, and uh, Zwev suddenly realized that, uh, you know, he was calling on the tanker guys on either side to fire and nothing was happening so he pulled up his hatch and he looked and the other tanks had already been disabled and out of the war. So he figured, well, I don't dare do this by myself. Uh, so he went behind some mountains. If you've been up on the Golan Heights, you know there's all these little mountains or hills. And he would went up behind them, and then he would come up over the top. He would pa uh, pop a tank and then back down, race to another hill, come up over the top, and <laughs> pop a tank and then back down. And he began to uh, report back to headquarters Zwift Brigade just got another one, you know, and, and the Syrians were listening and they figured he's got a whole, uh, you know, group of tanks behind all of these mountains. And uh, they began to uh, uh, be a little worried that it was so easy for them to come so far in. And what they figured is that the Jews had, had deliberately let them pour through and then they were going to cut them off and they would be surrounded. And uh, so... Uh, they began to panic and uh, they began to head towards Jordan in their tanks. Of course, what was happening is that, uh, of course, down in the Sinai, General Sharon uh, conquered the Sinai, crossed the Suez Canal, and uh, the headquarters were calling on him to, uh, to stop, uh, but he had the momentum going, and so he pulled off the uh, radio, you know, and just said, sorry, can't hear you, you know, and it kept the guys going. And uh, he wanted to go all of the way to uh, Cairo to really teach the Egyptians a lesson. He had trapped the whole third Egyptian army there in the Sinai Peninsula. Of course, Russia became involved and engaged. They sent pilots down to fly their planes. They sent uh, commanders down to man the tanks. And uh, I was with a lieutenant. Uh, he was our cab driver. And uh, uh, he said, uh, you're my last fare. I'm going to leave you off at your hotel. And then I have to go up uh, to the Golan to get into this fight. And uh, so, uh, I said, yes, this is a tough one because they've got a lot of sophisticated uh, Russian armor in this one. He said, no, we're fighting the Russians. I said, yeah, I know, the Russian uh, tanks and armor. He said, no, we've already found several Russian soldiers manning the tanks up in the Golan. And he said, uh, you know, the Russians themselves are involved. Interesting, Time Magazine reported that, but then suddenly it was cut off. You didn't hear about that anymore at all, that the Russians were actually engaged in the 73 war uh, as pilots and as tank commanders. Uh, that news was shut off from the world. Uh, and uh, what happened, of course, is that uh, Israel began to push the Russians back. And Kissinger, you remember, went over and they called it the shuttle diplomacy where he was flying from capital to capital trying to get a ceasefire. And actually at this very time, Russia was loading paratroopers into the planes in Russia and they were planning to send their paratroopers down to help their beleaguered allies uh, there in Israel. Finally, Kissinger announced the ceasefire uh, on a certain hour the next day. And uh, in the meantime, Damascus Radio was trying to, you know, this kind of uh, uh, campaign of, of uh, sort of, well, it, w they were lying. They were announcing Israel troops are fighting in the streets of Damascus. That was coming over the Damascus News that the Jews had already come all the way, they were 12 miles away from Damascus, uh, but they were announcing they are fighting in the streets of Damascus. The tank commanders out on the Golan Heights, they're listening to Damascus radio, surely they're going to tell us the truth. And when they heard that the Jews were already in Damascus, they turned towards Jordan and got out of there as quickly as they could, leaving this whole Golan area open. 
And so what the Jews did is send their paratroopers in and establish much broader borders because the ceasefire, they were to hold on to the line where they were at 10 o'clock the next day. And so they were able to conquer so much more territory. God was with them. I mean, it was just, you know, how can you explain it? Past history. It wasn't when Ezekiel wrote about it 2,500 years ago, but it is something that many of us have seen in our lifetime, and we know that just as Ezekiel said it would, it did happen. God said, I will do it, and he has done it. All right, let's go ahead. We've had Israel involved in these wars with their neighbors, and um, as we get into chapter 38 of Ezekiel, he takes us the next step. Now here's where we are. We're between chapters 37 and 38. 36, 37 are fulfilled. We're now coming to chapter 38, and this has not yet been fulfilled. But inasmuch as God did fulfill against all odds, chapters 36 and 37, you can be sure that chapter 38 is right on the horizon, and that's the next thing we're going to see. You know, when a reporter goes out to report, he has several questions that he asks. Who, when, where, why, and how? So who? In chapter 38, God is addressing Gog, who is the Rosh Prince of Magog, Meshach and Tubal. And he says that they will be aligned with Persia, which is Iran, Ethiopia, Libya, Gomer and Togarma, which is the area of Turkey. And when in the latter years, verse 8, the last days, you will come into the land that has been brought back from the sword and is gathered out of many people against the mountains of Israel, which have always been waste, but have now been brought forth out of the nations. And you will come up against my people of Israel as a cloud to cover the land, and it will be in the latter days, or the last days, and I will bring you against my land. Why? That the heathen, God said, may know me when I am sanctified in thee, O Gog, before their eyes. Notice again the phrase, when I am sanctified. So that which he had predicted earlier, he's going to be sanctified in the eyes. When does that happen? When this battle takes place. When Iran, backed by Russia, along with Turkey, along with Libya, along with Ethiopia, uh, decide once more that they're going to obliterate the nation of Israel. Isn't it interesting that we're hearing a lot of talk out of Iran now about annihilating Israel and, uh, you know, bringing an end to this nation and all. And that's where we are right now. And you wonder, you know, how can this little nation of Israel possibly survive? with Iran developing nuclear weapons, with Russia helping them in this development with uh, the uh, missiles that they have and uh, with Russia's might and power, how will Israel ever survive? I saw a t-shirt in Jerusalem this Israeli boy was wearing. It says, don't worry, America, Israel is behind you. <laughs> but we are reading in verse 12 of chapter 38 of Ezekiel, you've come to take a spoil, to take a prey, to turn your hand against the desolate places that are now inhabited, and upon the people that are gathered out of the nations, which have gotten the cattle and the goods and that dwell in the midst of the land. How is God going to destroy them? 
Verse 18, it shall come to pass in the same time when Gog, uh, that is the chief ruler of uh, Russia, Magog is the area of Russia, God shall come against the land of Is Gog shall come against the land of Israel, saith the Lord God, that my fury will come up in my face. For in my jealousy and in the fire of my wrath have I spoken. Surely in that day there will be a great shaking in the land of Israel. So that the fish of the sea, the fowls of the heaven, and the beasts of the field, and all creeping things that creep upon the earth, and the men that are upon the face of the earth, shall shake at my presence, and the mountains will be thrown down, the steep places shall fall, and every uh, wall shall fall to the ground, and I will call for a sword against him, Gog, throughout all of my mountains, saith the Lord God, every man's sword against his brother. Uh, they will begin to fight against each other, and this is not something new. Uh, go back to the story of Jehoshaphat in the Old, Te Old Testament, you get an idea of, of what God is going to do in this one. I will plead against him uh, with a pestilence and with blood. I will rain upon him and upon his bands and many people that are with him an overflowing rain and great hailstones, fire and brimstone. Zechariah again adds to this, he said, and it's, this shall be the plague wherewith the Lord will smite all of the people that have fought against Jerusalem. Their flesh shall consume away while they stand on their feet. Their eyes will consume away in their sockets and their tongues will consume away in their mouth. When the United States dropped uh, the bombs on Nagasaki, uh, and Hiroshima, uh, those that were near the uh, impact center and those that were a few miles away, the heat was so intense their eyeballs melted and ran down their cheeks, just like God describes here the destruction by which the enemies of Israel will be destroyed. Their eyes shall consume in their sockets. It shall come to pass in that day that a great tumult of the Lord shall be among them, and they will lay hold every one on his neighbor, and his hand shall rise up against the hand of his neighbor. Again, Zechariah talking about this internal conflict with the nations that are coming against Israel. And God said back to Ezekiel now, I will magnify myself and sanctify myself. In that day when I am sanctified, God said, uh, and it will be the day in which he destroys this company of nations that are coming to destroy his people and try to drive them out of the land. So, you know, when you look at it from just the natural standpoint, you think, oh, poor little Israel, they don't have a chance. But when you look at it from God's standpoint, you say, oh, poor Russia. <laughs> they don't have a chance. It isn't this combination of nations against Israel. It's against God. And God is the one who is going to defend her and turn them back. And he will be sanctified then in the eyes of the people. Actually, the result five-sixths of the invading army will be destroyed. Israel will uh, burn the spoils of war for seven years, and for s seven months they will be burying the dead from this battle. And God said, so will I make my holy name known in the midst of my people Israel. I'll not let them pollute my holy name anymore, and the heathen shall know that I am the Lord, the Holy One of Israel. Praise the Lord. This is the ultimate outcome. When I have brought them again from the people and gathered them out of their enemies' lands and am sanctified in the sight of many nations, when this happens, then they shall know that I am the Lord their God, which caused them to be led into captivity among the heathen, but I have gathered them into their own land and have left none of them any more there. Neither will I hide my face any more from them, 
for I have poured out my spirit upon the house of Israel, saith the Lord. Right now, God's spirit is poured out upon the Gentile nations. The Bible speaks about uh, blindness has happened in Israel in part until the fullness of the Gentiles is come in. But then God promises he's going to put his spirit upon the nation of Israel once again, which means that the Gentile church will be out of here at that time. So where are we in the line of Bible prophecy? Well, I'll tell you what. When you read the paper tomorrow and you read of the threats against Israel by uh, the Iranians and uh, when you read of the Russians supporting uh, Syria with uh, new weapons and Iran with new weapons and all, just know, just know, we're at the door. Our Lord is coming soon. 